I'm gonna just re I'm gonna repeat history. Just to let y'all know, I'm gonna repeat history. I won the last time where it counts. I'm gonna win here where it counts again. I used to say slurs and bigoted language. You know, there were racial slurs, there were homophobic slurs, there were words referencing sexual assault. Look at that! Nice troll. That guy's a champion. <laughs> There were more than the, just the Wadi incidents where I like had like statutory incidents happen to me as a kid. We were like best friends for years, despite everything. So we have another controversial scenario with a Smash Bros. player, in this case Wadi. Uh, another top player has been outed uh, for some abusive and now some underage misconduct. Not me has made a video about me. Let's see what the hell he's got to say about me. Where is Wadi? For the past several months, I've been asking myself the same question. But ever since he deactivated his social media, after numerous allegations surfaced on Twitter... Hey, what? it's actually called X now? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. On X? <clears throat> I've since been unable to reach him for comment. But more importantly, who is Wadi? Chris Boston, or as you might know him better by his gamer alias, Wadi was a professional Smash Bros player from Virginia. At his peak, he was known as the best Rob and Mewtwo player in the world, staying true to his previous namesake of Wadi Rob before being cut short, and he was also one of the most dominant players from his region. His competitive prowess aside, he was also a staple of the now defunct Panda Global's content team, and had a sizable following to show for it. However, that would all change four months ago, on April 29th, 2023. Juno is a fellow Smash player and Twitch streamer, who became closely acquainted with Wadi after reaching out to him around December of last year. She would post a twit longer shortly after their breakup, detailing her numerous concerns. According to her, she ended up messaging him because she heard from her friend that there was a great chance he'd have a crush on her. Which apparently piqued her interest, because months later they'd not only be dating, but she'd even quit her job to live with him. Surprisingly, this came right after initially rejecting him because she quote, wasn't that into him." Unquote. Unfortunately, she would only spend a grand total of two weeks at his place before Wadi decided to break things off and she was packing her stuff the same night. Now, some of you might think that moving in with a person you've only known for four months seems a little rushed. And I'm here to tell you, I'm some of you, it is, and don't do it. If you were on X at any point in time when this relationship was going on or during their announcement, there were a few exchanges regarding the difference in age between Wadi and Juno. Wadi being 27 and Juno being 19. Here's my take on that. Uh. Wadi could be 70, forming the human centipede at an 18 year old orgy with him in the middle and I would still not give a fuck. I don't care what two consenting adults are doing in their free time. That's not my job and I don't get paid extra for pretending to care. And from the looks of it, from an outsider perspective, things seem to be going well. The relationship, not the human centipede, even though I'm sure he would have excelled at it. So what exactly caused this relationship to sour so quickly to where it would devolve into several twitlongers with accompanying allegations? In her post, she'd outlined three major red flags that he was exhibiting. One, that he was a trans fetishizer who didn't want a woman, but he wanted someone who looked like one and had a penis. Classic dilemma. Two, after the initial rejection, he ceased all communication with her, aka ghosting. And three, that he couldn't let go of his exes with the potential concern for cheating sprinkled on top. But of course, the worst instance described above all else being that he allegedly told her one night she'd be unable to go to sleep unless she performed oral. Now in her retelling of events, she was unsure if she could really classify this as rape, but that it really felt like it. It's important to note for legal reasons that there doesn't seem to be any struggle, repealing of consent, or lack thereof in this recollection of events. Only that she felt an obligation to do so, that she lived rent-free in a mutually agreed upon, self-described 1940s housewife relationship. Yet nevertheless, she still felt considerable disgust and cried later in the bathroom. Considering that Wadi has already shown proof of therapy for how he approaches relationships in general, 
there may be a hint of truth to this sentiment. I reached out to Juno for further comment, and her response was that she reconnected with her friend group recently, and now she lives with them, and has a full-time job. She's doing much better, and feels like she's already said everything pertinent to the case. But you see, I'm a stickler for the rules, and one of those rules just so happens to be innocent until proven guilty. And seeing as this wasn't a social experiment, a prank, or a cam show on the dark web, there was only one other person I could go to to get the full story. Uh, I deactivated because I needed to process what was happening. And I was scared of all the death threats of being treated like a criminal, despite not even giving my side out. People were so quick to take her side before I put my twit longer out. So I figured what's even the point. And on top of everything, my mom is reading all the negative comments and hateful comments and constantly calling me, crying, checking on me to make sure I'm okay and that I wouldn't hurt myself while not knowing that I wasn't even reading any of it. I was actually only a couple of weeks or months from retiring in the first place uh, with me leaving Panda and not really enjoying Smash Ultimate or content creation much anymore. So it was very easy for me to step away from everything. Uh, it just it, it hurt to see all the people who I've known for years instantly side against me. It's important to note that Wadi's absence only came after the appearance of another story. And given that Juno's ties heavily into its motivations, it's imperative that we address it first. So hang in there with me, alright? We are getting to it. You see the dogs? The dogs are out. And while it is true that Wadi deactivated his account, a response to Juno's claims was actually posted roughly an hour beforehand. But what do you know? Lucky us. In it, he clarifies his sexual orientation as being bisexual slash pansexual, includes the DMs of their earliest interactions in December, states that he told her to hold off on moving in, and to keep her job, which was met with persistence from her, shows a tweet from her cooking to illustrate her content with their living arrangement, and last but not least, firmly denies overstepping any sexual boundaries set in their relationship. Hell, he even goes the whole nine yards and says that the purpose of their falling out was that he was simply not mentally ready for a relationship. Against my better judgment, I started dating Juno. It did feel weird in the beginning, and I told her at the start that I wasn't looking for anything serious. But over time, she constantly begged to be claimed, as she would put it, by me, and seemed like she was in need of a place to stay because her roommate, Click, would really make her feel unsafe. She really made Click seem like a psychopath. So I'd let her stay with me whenever she was either locked out of the house, screwed over by Click, or just plain scared of him, which was pretty often. When I, I moved to a new apartment, I didn't want her to move with me, or at least give me some time to think things over. And I told her that I didn't want her to move in so quickly and to keep her job multiple times till whenever I was ready, which I, I didn't know when that would be. But she really insisted that she move in with me as soon as possible. Uh, she was very persistent in getting away from Click and everything that I finally agreed. And I was completely stunned when I saw the twit longer because it was pretty off of how I act. I always respected her boundaries. I was really embarrassed and humiliated at the things she was saying. And I, I feel like the only reason she would say these things is to get back at me for breaking up with her. We would joke around talking about how she was going to cancel me if we broke up. And numerous people have come up to me and warned me. I'm not a threat to anyone. I've been in the scene for seven years and I've tried to be a positive role model in the community. Now that both of them have had a chance to explain their side in full, this is the part of the video where I tell you, the viewer, what to think. Exciting stuff. Apologies to those of you who already have a really strong opinion and are definitely not hearing most of these details for the first time because it's been neatly packaged with your TikTok temple run attention span in mind. A 20 minute video? Bah humbug. TLDR. Hey, thanks for the- Man, I- Before they even got together, Juno said that there were multiple red flags. The first being his apparent focus on the physical attraction. More specifically, his dream of someone who looked like a woman, but had a penis. Fun quote, I know, I'm gonna throw it around a couple times. Wadi labels himself a pansexual, but rather than taking his word for it, let's look at his dating history. His ex fiance was a woman, his ex Joy was also a woman. And this is more of a guess, really, so don't crucify me here if uh, I happen to get it wrong, but, um... 
Both of them do not have a penis. Now, I'm not gonna be stubborn here. Obviously, you could date someone while still having a completely separate fetish. Like a gay guy marrying a woman to hide the fact that he really, really likes men. I just don't see how he didn't want a woman makes sense when right after Juno rejected him, she says he went back to try and get with his ex Joy, which as I've just stated, is a penisless woman. I'm not seeing a reason to disbelieve Wadi on his own sexual orientation. And the fact that the last story we're going over is a potential relationship with a guy? The man is his own biggest advocate here, so it just makes this really hard to believe. The part I haven't touched on until now is that prior to all this, Juno was having issues, both financial and interpersonal, when it came to her living situation. Bills were overbearing, and because her roommate Click was nervous to give her a key, she'd often get locked out of the house. And even after being rejected, and exhibiting behavior that Juno would later describe as super weird, Wadi was seemingly able to rebuild the bridge by extending a helping hand, giving her streaming advice, boosts in viewership, a place to visit when in need, and eventually a free rent and grocery arrangement in exchange for traditional housewife duties. Cooking, cleaning, the whole shebang. I don't know how much was in the fine print of this arrangement, but as far as the alleged incident of demanding oral, this is what Wadi had to say. It started off as she agreed to give me head after a tournament one day. And after the tournament, she didn't do it. This was, this was like, a couple days to a week before the actual incident. So that doesn't happen. And, you know, days pass and, you know, there's no activity, which is fine. It's expected because I know that she has low libido. So I'm not pressing her about it. And then the day of the questioning, it's just a regular day. I'm just, you know, we're, we're in bed and we're joking around. I tease her a little bit about the head that she didn't give. And she wound up giving it, and that was the end of it. Like, we joked around afterwards, before, it was just like any other day. There was no signs of me at all that she was upset at any point. Like, there's been numerous times where she didn't want to, and that was that. I didn't push it. At the end of the day, things didn't work out for me with Juno. And I broke up with her, and she immediately started packing without hesitation. I didn't know if I could count it as rape because I was his and I felt bad for not being so sexual around him, but it really felt like it. Again, I hate to be the bad guy and spit facts and quite frankly fire on occasion, Shout out to Night Dash. but there is no repeal of consent. I understand that you both had a major falling out over the intimacy in your relationship and that your libido was severely affected by the drugs that you were taking. I get that. But couples have sex all the time just to make the other person happy. Unless it was forced in any way or there was any kind of struggle or refusal involved at all, I can't in good conscience classify this as a sex crime. A regrettable instance of intimacy? Sure. A lack of proper communication between partners? Definitely. But beyond that, there's really nothing me or anyone else can do for you here. And even then, me and everyone else have no idea what happened in that bedroom, and I'm hearing two different stories. So, the advice I would have given you is to break up with him. I mean, you already did that, so, hey, good on you. But I'm only giving an opinion because it was made a topic of public discussion, not because I perceive it as an actual crime. Given that Wadi has now abruptly ended a relationship twice, in the case of Juno and Joy, leaving the woman in tears and is now seeking therapy over it, I think it's safe to say that he is a pretty shit boyfriend. But if we're calling out Wadi for being inconsiderate, bad at relationships, and unexpectedly cutting people out of his life, it's only fair if we look at Juno as well. So excuse me while I put my therapist hat on. I only have so many hats. Okay, I'm just gonna take it from the top and give it to you straight on how I think this relationship shook out. Quitting your job and moving in with someone with red flags that you don't even like just so they'll pay for your rent and food, to put it lightly, isn't the brightest idea. The whole reason you reached out to Wadi that you stated in your twit longer was because you heard he had a crush on you. And after rejecting him the first time because he wasn't your type, allegedly fetishized you, and was super fucking weird, you only decided to date him to lessen your financial burden because you felt you had no other choice. You're 19 years old, you're an adult, come on. You did have another choice. Budget better, work harder, maybe, you know, find people like the roommates you're living with now, which is fantastic, and just pay for your shit. All right, fuck this goofy ass hat. 
All right, the bit's over. Am I seriously supposed to believe that your only option was to cook, clean, and have sex with a Smash player to afford rent? I mean, fuck, I'd get it if it was MK Leo, but this nigga Wadi's balling on a budget over here. You only get so much ad revenue from collabing with Mr. Clean. Of course Wadi was gonna break up with you, and of course you didn't want to have sex with him. You didn't even like him in the first place. So while I do agree that him cutting you off right after moving in is a massive dick move, and he's definitely not the good guy here, uh, you're no Mother Teresa either. There's really no winner here. And the only redeeming part is that we'd finally get answers to a story everyone thought had come to a conclusion three years ago in July of 2020. I'm using a pro controller to move my teleprompter. This is some next level shit. Hi, I'm Squirk. I used to be a part of the Smash community a while ago. Now I'm not, <laughs> but I had some pretty unfortunate experiences as a part of it. So we're kind of just talking about that. Squirk would make his appearance a day later and add fuel to a fire that most had assumed would inevitably fade into obscurity given the lack of evidence and overall severity. We'd come to find that the one who'd sheltered Juno after her sudden departure from Wadi's residence was none other than Squirk himself, the aforementioned friend of Wadi's in Juno's Twitlonger. After being the first to hear of their breakup and the second time he'd housed one of Wadi's exes, this would be the final straw. Even though they were best friends at the time, Squirk had had enough of witnessing how Wadi had handled these women and would use his own experience to not only support Juno, but as a much needed wake up call. He wrote that when he was around 15 or 16, the at the time 20 year old Wadi would develop a romantic relationship with him. This would allegedly last around three to four days and involved one sexual encounter. The context is me and a bunch of other people from Southern Virginia would drive up to Northern Virginia and stay somewhere, usually at Zephyr's house, because Zephyr had like a decently big house. We, we would stay up there for like a couple weeks at a time sometimes, I think. You, um, you would stay at that place? Like you would just stay yeah, over? Yeah, oh. I, I definitely stayed for like about a week, maybe a little bit more one time. It was just like a house, like, right? There was a guest room, uh, there was a living room. The living room probably has like somebody on the couch and then two people on the floor or something. And then the guest room. I don't remember exactly all, like who all came up the time that something happened with me and him. I do know though that we had the guest room uh, and obviously that's where stuff happened. Was there um, any alcohol involved? I heard that there might have been alcohol at Zephyr's place when there was always alcohol. Yeah, I, I think I don't think I drank a whole lot. I, I don't remember if they like didn't let me drink or like I just didn't drink or whatever. But I, I don't think I was intoxicated. Okay. And Wadi's never he didn't like drink a whole lot back then. So I'm pretty sure he was mostly sober. But that's where stuff happened. Uh, we had sex at the time. I think I was under the impression that like we were going to be a thing like we were going to date or something just like going off of the texts that I was uh, looking through before we called. There exist screenshots that would suggest that what Squirk alleged about a blossoming relationship could be reliably corroborated. But before we dive further, it'd be wrong of me not to mention one crucial detail. The ages written here are incorrect. Using the dates provided on the screenshots of November 11, 2016 and both of their birthdays, it'd become instantly clear that Squirk wasn't 15 or 16, he was actually 17. And Wadi was thankfully still 20. At least one of the ages was right. I was curious as to how a mix-up like this could occur, and I think the two main issues were that it was a rush twit longer on Squirk's end, and it was also an approximation of ages based on memory. Just to clarify, do you uh, know if it happened when you were 17 and he was 20? Because that's around when the screenshots are dated that I checked. Uh, I don't know if it might have happened prior, like two months prior than the ones dated in. I'm not sure if it so was like October. I know it was during the second half of the year because I remember when it happened, it was cold as fuck in the, the guest room because like the window was open or something like that. That's all I remember, but I can try to like verify. So I know it was like sometime in like like late fall or like winter or something like that. I wanna say maybe December. So I, I wanna say I was probably 17. Okay. Bearing in mind that it's only a three year age difference and it would be legal in 40 out of the 50 states of the US, I get that some of you might not see a problem with that, depending on where you grew up. And on a moral level, it may even be gray. However, this was not one of those states. In Virginia, the age of consent is 18. 
So please, if you're going to talk about this, I urge you to remember that when discussing it on a legal level. For this segment, I'm not going to have a voice acted reading of anyone's entire twit longer or every single sentence of every screenshot because I know how to paraphrase and I'm not going to insult your intelligence by assuming you can't just go read it yourself. So instead, I'll have a link to all of the required reading if you're interested in the description of this video. If that's too much of an issue, don't worry, you're in luck, because I'm certain someone else will make a video doing the boring part for me. While Squirk stated that he didn't really have any proof for any of his claims, the evidence he'd provide in his follow-up would beg to differ. Several screenshots of his conversation with Wadi showed that he told Wadi's ex fiance of a potential crush he had, and Wadi was more than willing to reciprocate, shown here attempting to cuddle, convince him of pursuing the relationship, and a brief mention of oral that would make the claim of a sexual encounter hold that much more weight. I've talked to both parties involved, and there's nothing to suggest that these messages would be faked. I'd venture to say these are probably real. However, while it does seem likely that something sexual might have occurred, only Squirk has gone on record to confirm this. So to cover all my bases, I'm going to continue to refer to this as alleged. But what's not alleged is the talk of a relationship. There's no question about that. Saying things like, I'm open to try a relationship and just try it. You can try it for like just one day and if you don't like it, it's fine. The back and forth continues in a similar vein. Where Wadi is dead set on convincing Squirk and Squirk seems worried that he'd end up hurting anyone he dated and didn't want to lose a friend. But the feelings did at least seem mutual. That is until Wadi would begin to pursue his now ex fiance senpai but you get the idea. How were you able to mend the relationship between you and Wadi after the whole, um, you know, choosing a side thing? I think after him and Senpai, like, were publicly together for a while, I kind of just got over it. I, I think, like, we had, like, an argument on Twitter one time, because that shit happens all the time in the Smash community. I think we, like, hung out at the tournament or something with, like, a big group of people, and I was, like, probably 19 at this time or something, and I was like, ah, it's whatever. I've been there for him at his highs and his lowest of lows multiple times, but he refused to reach out. And this is someone who claimed to be my best friend for the past seven years. If he was my so-called best friend, then why when I tried to talk to him the night of, he refused to speak to me and hear my side and went on her side 100%. I told him I'm taking an actual step and getting therapy for my relationship issues. He asked for proof, then proceeded to make the twit longer side with her. In the twit longer, Squirt goes on to say that he felt he was groomed and manipulated into the relationship, but didn't feel any severe mental trauma as a result. This likely came after reevaluating his experience when compared to how Wadi treated both Juno and Joy, two women that he'd eventually house in the fallout of their relationship with Wadi. I'm like totally fine. Like I'm so not bothered by what happened. You said that in your um, twit longer, right? Like you weren't traumatized yeah. or anything, but you were doing yeah. this to kind of bring some more attention towards Juno's side and give mm -hmm. more validity towards the argument she was making about the relationship. Yeah, so pretty much I, the only reason I really said what I said, I'm not traumatized by it. It really didn't affect me. It was a consensual thing from my end. I don't know. I'll, just, I'll, I'll say that. It was for sure consensual, even though I was a minor. It took like reflecting from me to be like, yeah, this is very similar to what he did to me in the past. I mean, it was as if we were a couple when I was 17 and he was 20. Um, and then he just like said, fuck you pretty much and started dating senpai. As stated previously, Wadi has yet to make an official comment on the alleged sexual encounter with Squirk. So for the sake of argument, let's say that along with the screenshots, the sexual encounter did occur. While I don't personally think that a three-year age gap is the most heinous thing imaginable, when it be legal in four-fifths of the United States, it isn't in Virginia. And as a rule of thumb, you should generally avoid dating anyone under 18, because regardless of the age of consent, if the case, let's say, involves sexting, it can still get you into some really hot water. In the possible event that there wasn't any intimate contact between the two, I'd still take issue with the talk of dating and hinting at oral, for the reasons I just stated. Do I agree with it? No. But the oh-so-golden question, my viewers, is would it warrant a ban from Smash? Well, normally I'd say yes, on the grounds that it, it breaks the law in Virginia. But while I was looking into their laws, even if you were 18 in Virginia, having sex with your 17-year-old girlfriend, you'd still be breaking the law, my friend. That would only carry a year in jail and or a $2,500 fine, which is fucking insane. <laughs> so I think we need to think a little bit outside of the box here. Um, 
and that box being Virginia. So thinking in the entire scope of the United States, how I would perceive this case, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, since this happened seven years ago, uh, they're only three years apart in age. It was entirely consensual from the alleged victim's standpoint. There was no severe trauma. It was more a story of mistreated relationships and, and possible emotional abuse as well. And they also remained best friends for six years afterwards. Well, I wouldn't do it. Um, and I definitely think it's weird. I also wouldn't throw him in jail over it. I don't know, that just comes off as a little excessive to me. But they don't call me technicals for nothing, okay? I am absolutely a stickler for the rules. I feel that my hand has been forced to at least throw the book at him, so to speak. So here's what we're gonna do. Out of respect for Squirk and the state of Virginia, a year ban would be more than fair. And that would be my suggestion uh, going forward. With four months time served since deactivating in April because he hasn't been going to anything. And I think that's fair to factor in if we're going to, um, if we're going to take that route. Or he could just send me $2,500 and we'll call it even. Moving on, there's still a couple things I'd like to address before wrapping up. When Squirk told me about the alleged sexual encounter, he also mentioned a location that would implicate another party in the story. Apparently, this took place at a guy named Zephyr's house. I looked up his account on X and he had me blocked, but now the account is just gone. That seems to be the trend nowadays and is making my job a lot fucking harder. From what I've gathered, Zephyr would often have a diverse group of local community members over at his place. These gatherings would consist of alcohol, video games, and presumably a little debauchery. All good fun until BAM, the miners show up to the function. Then you got a real wildfire on your hands. Now, as I've stated previously, I have to reiterate this, the sexual encounter is still alleged and there was no alcohol involved in that story. But places like Zephyr's having minors over for days at a time with easy access to alcohol is part of the reason this stupid shit keeps coming down the smash allegation pipeline. And it's also why I'm still employed. We would always like joke about Zephyr being like a creep. Turns out he kind of is, but like, the night after me and Wadi did stuff, he like made a joke to me about it. Like implying that he knew something happened. I don't remember the exact joke, mm -hmm. but I was like, right. how the fuck does he know? Was this um, like a well-known secret around that, that circle in MDVA? There were definitely people who like, quote unquote knew without like proof, I guess. It, I mean, there was somebody who made a post like, I think I remember back in 2020, something like that did happen because there was yeah. a statement from both you and Wadi. Right, that's when uh, I told him, I was like, yeah, I'll cover for you. For me, I was like, yeah, he's not a bad person, yada, yada. Uh, he's still my friend. I don't want him to take a fall for something that doesn't affect me. Yeah. So how old were you when some of this other stuff happened, like with Promelia, if you don't mind me asking? I think I was younger when it happened with Promelia. I think I was 16 or 15. It happened at the other Abuser Heroes house at a party. I remember like actually drinking at this party, Promelia like also drinking or something like that. And like, I was like laying on the couch and he came up to me and cuddled me or something. And then like took me into the bathroom. Black Yoshi slept on the floor in the room near the bathroom and he like made a joke about it like the next morning or something before we left for a tournament. So how it, it was, old was crazy. he, um, the Promelia? Oh, he was like, oh, Promelia was like 28 at the time. Oh my God. He, he might've been like 26 or something. Uh, and then Black Yoshi was like 21 or something. Well, I appreciate you speaking up about it uh, now. Even yeah, of course. action being taken. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean like, fuck the Smash community. I feel like it's never gonna get better, but. <laughs> uh, you and me both. The, the, yeah, the adults really gotta take charge. The parents who make their fan accounts of their children and go to events to support them. That's awesome. That's really wholesome. I love that. Keep doing that. But that should just be fucking normal, right? I have no idea why a 15 year old is able to fly across the US by themselves and sleep with some random fucking Dominican guy. Is he Dominican? I don't know. Puerto Rican? Whatever. Why is that happening? Why is that? What the fuck? How about instead of throwing out every person's water bottle, we actually make sure that everyone under 16 has a parent or guardian accompanying them. I say 16, but that's really just an arbitrary number. I mean, as long as there's some guideline that makes sense, that's all that matters. How, after the events of 2020, that isn't number one priority on every event's regulations is an enigma to me.
Like people normally do whenever someone's under fire, Click, Juno's roommate she mentioned earlier, who was too nervous to give her a key, came out with a story of his own about Wadi. Now that Wadi is gone, I need to say that I went to a local in Richmond and I lost to him in Losers. Later that day, he called my roommate and he didn't know I was listening to him talk. And he said, dude, when I beat Click, I got so hard. Like, dude. I was like, he was going to keep talking too, but he was cut off before it got worse. I should have known in that moment. Bruh, that nigga drove me home one time. Click. That is so obviously not meant to be taken literally. The fact that you use this situation to make an opportunistic dig at Wadi says way more about you than him. What a fucking loser. You knew Wadi better than I or like most people would. Does he make jokes like that? Like he makes like- Yeah, uh... he does. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, okay. That, that sounds like a joke he would make. I don't think it, honestly, knowing him, that should not be taken seriously. <laughs> I think that's not like, I think that was a joke. I, I, I just had to get the, the first hand yeah. knowledge on that. As for the click situation, the tweet he put out, I don't even know why he tweeted that. It was clearly a joke. Uh, I feel like anyone with a brain would, would see that. As for the payment for my uh, content team, they haven't been forgotten and I let the, the co-owner of Panda notify them. Uh, it's being taken care of and I'm sorry that it's taking so long to get, to get them paid. Hopefully that's all settled for anyone worrying about that. A relationship doomed to fail. A man doomed to repeat it. And a friend wishing only to break the cycle. Wadi's tale isn't one I could say I'd envy, but his atonement is not up for any one man to decide, and the damage done now will likely remain for years to come. I never had any deep connection to Wadi or his online presence. To me, he was always the goofy Eddie Murphy of the Smash community, and maybe it was better that way. Because after picking up the broken pieces in my search for the whole truth, I saw something different. I saw a man struggling to find his better half. A man removed from what once made him great. But above all else, I saw a man who was flawed. And who among us can say we're any different? Who am I to play judge, jury, and executioner? Well, I'm a f YouTuber with 100k subs. Who are you? Fucking nobody. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's not... It was just a joke. I'm, I'm just joking. Or am I? People are well within their right to criticize Wadi over his situation with Squirk. If that's something you disagree with, I'm not gonna stop you. But crucifying someone over a three year age gap from seven years ago? Uh, I don't know. Just keep shit proportional to the crime is all I'm saying. Don't get me wrong, I'm down to clown on punishment. I just, I just gave you one earlier. But that just doesn't really give me that life sentence gut punch, you know? All jokes aside, I don't think Juno, Squirk, Wadi, or really anyone in this case is a bad person. Juno was struggling financially and trusted that a Smash player could fix that. Squirk was tired of cleaning up after Wadi's mistakes, and Wadi has had issues spanning a decade on how to treat the people he cares about. With all of the evidence provided, I think we can conclude that no, Wadi is not a rapist, nor would I classify him as a threat to children were he to come back to events in the future. I know he's mentioned retiring, but you never know. He does, however, have a very poor love life, apparently, and I hope the therapy does him some good in the foreseeable future, which is really none of my concern anyways, uh, but it was brought up, so there you go. And with that, that concludes this case for the time being. I want to thank everyone involved for being as cooperative as they were, because it's very hard to get people to actually respond, um, so I do really appreciate that. And I want to thank you guys for still being here with me after all this time. I'm jumping the gun a little bit, and there's still going to be a 100k special, but this has been a dream of mine for a very long time, and I, I felt like I worked really hard to get here, so thank you. Thank you, all the patrons. Thank you, guys. Like, it, it really does mean the world to me. Hopefully now everyone knows exactly where Wadi is. Until next time. At the end of the day, I've, I've made bad decisions and choices. 
at this current moment, I have no plans of coming back. Um, as for what I'm doing now, I've moved on and I'm pursuing other things. I want to thank all my supporters who were there for the ride of my career. I've always loved my Billies and I will miss you guys.